Hey everybody, just a quick thank you before this episode. You may recall that a while back I shared that nominations were open for this year's Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Awards. These are like the Academy Awards for the cocktail community. Well, apparently some of you, a great many in fact, must have been paying attention because I'm stunned and honored to announce that the Modern Bar Cart Podcast is a top 10 finalist for the award called Best Broadcast Podcast or Online Video Series. Over on the show notes page, I'll link to the entire Spirited Awards playbill so that you can check out all the other amazing folks who are in the running for awards this year. If you'd like to join me for the live virtual 2021 Spirited Awards ceremony, that'll take place on Thursday, September 23rd at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. Just remember, Tales of the Cocktail usually takes place in New Orleans, so it's Central Time. Check out the Tales of the Cocktail website for more info on how to join the fun. So yeah, just wanted to say thank you to everyone who nominated. We love putting together great interviews and deep dives for you every week. And this is awesome motivation to keep pushing the envelope with what we can accomplish in the realm of spirits and cocktails. Now, on to the show. Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern bar cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 203 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for tuning in to this interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I hang out with master distiller Ryan Christensen, co-founder of Caledonia Spirits, makers of Bar Hill Gin. If you've spent any time in the beverage world, you've probably come across their products at your favorite cocktail bars. Bar Hill Gin is a favorite of bartenders for its righteous blend of juniper, honey, and sustainability. But before we get too far into the weeds here, or perhaps I should say too far into the wildflowers, let's take a quick pit stop so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Bee's Knees. To make it, you'll need one and a half ounces of Bar Hill Gin, three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice, and three quarters of an ounce of honey syrup. More on that in just a moment. Combine these ingredients in a cocktail shaker with ice, give them a nice vigorous shake, then strain into your favorite stemmed cocktail glass, garnish with a lemon twist or a small lemon wheel, and enjoy. Now we featured the bee's knees before. It's your basic gin sour with lemon as the acid and honey syrup for the sweet component. What I'd like to do here is give you a few ideas about how to riff intelligently on this cocktail at home. Essentially, how to make it your own. The real key to this cocktail is keeping the sweet and sour in balance. And when I say that, I know most of you are thinking about the honey syrup and the lemon juice. But what you shouldn't forget is the role that the botanicals in the gin play in giving your palate something to think about besides the sweet honey and the tart lemon juice. So as you play around with different variations on a bee's knees, I'd highly recommend varying your gin based on the different outcomes you're trying to achieve. For a classic bee's knees, Bar Hill Gin is absolutely magnificent. The juniper shines through like a beam of light. But if you were to, say, split your honey syrup with a little bit of green chartreuse, for example, you might want a lighter gin as your base spirit. Last process note here, a lot of people balk at making the bee's knees cocktail at home because when they see honey syrup, they think there's gonna be a lot of sticky dishes and stovetop monitoring involved. So if, like me, you're quasi-allergic to making more dishes than you absolutely need to, worry not. You can simply warm a bowl of water in the microwave, then stir in twice as much honey as you have water, because unlike simple syrup, honey syrup is a two to one sugar to water ratio. After you mix in that honey, feel free to nuke it again if you need to get it nice and hot so that all that sweetness can dissolve, and you're pretty much good at that point to bottle it up and stick it in the fridge. All you need is literally a microwave, a bowl, 
some honey, and a spoon. Finally, I'd like to put a fun Bees Knees event on your calendar. This year, Bar Hill Gin is excited to announce its fifth annual Bees Knees Week, which will take place nationwide from September 24th to October 3rd. This year, the goal of Bees Knees Week is to plant 500,000 square feet, that's more than 10 acres of bee habitat across the US. Using the Bees Knees cocktail as its rallying call, this year's initiative includes 2,000 bars, restaurants, and stores participating nationwide. But what if you're just a humble home bartender? How do you show the bees some love? Well, it's easy. All you gotta do is snap a photo of your favorite Bees Knees cocktail, whether it's one that you make or one that you enjoy at your favorite cocktail bar, post that on social media using the hashtag Bees Knees Week, and then tag Bar Hill Gin. In return, what they're gonna do is underwrite the planting of 10 square feet of pollinator habitat for every photo posted. Again, keep in mind this event will take place between September 24th and October 3rd, 2021, and be sure to follow Bar Hill Gin on social media for updates and reminders. So, now that you've received your 200 level crash course on one of the most popular gin sour cocktails of all time, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this wide-ranging and pine-scented conversation with master distiller Ryan Christensen, some of the topics we discuss include how time spent in his father's hardware store as a child led Ryan to appreciate taking complicated equipment apart and bringing people and communities together. What it was like to build Caledonia Spirits from the ground up, alongside his partner and beekeeper, Todd Hardy. Why Bar Hill Gin defies categorization as a London Dry, Old Tom, or New American Style Gin. Some thoughts on the finicky and inconsistent barrel-aged gin category, and what makes Bar Hill's Tomcat Reserve product such a standout example of what a barrel-aged gin could and probably should more often be. Along the way, we cover the tricky business of understanding where bees have been hanging out, some hints as to the location of the mythical juniper extraction curve, why hazy martinis are set to be the next big cocktail craze, and much, much more. What comes out of this interview, besides a delicious gin tasting for me, is a lesson in cultivating a beginner's mindset in all things. Ryan models a deep respect and curiosity for the organisms, chemical compounds, and complex ecosystems responsible for making Bar Hill Gin a reality. And when your products receive national acclaim and widespread distribution, it's very easy to let that humble, inquisitive mindset fall by the wayside. But if you're able to stay focused on experimenting and building a great team around you like Ryan has done, there's no telling what you can achieve. With that, please enjoy this Juniper Forward Honey Drizzled conversation with Bar Hill Gin Master Distiller, Ryan Christensen. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Eric, great to be here. Let's kick it off as we always do by having you introduce yourself to our listeners. Who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so my name is Ryan Christensen. I'm the head distiller and president at Caledonia Spirits. We are the distillers of Bar Hill Gin, and uh, we're located in Montpelier, Vermont. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, we have a lot to dig into here, uh, including a tasting of a couple of your beautiful products. But every distiller, I find, has a pretty unique story about how they come to the art and science of distillation. So I'm wondering if you might begin this interview by giving us your personal journey, kind of starting in the early days, whatever those are to you, and then walking us through the journey that you took to become a distiller. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I think it, for me, it goes back all the way to seventh grade when my, my folks, you know, they, they made a courageous leap and um, bought a small town struggling hardware store, basically a hardware store that was going out of business. And I watched my dad sort of give up his corporate job and take this entrepreneurial plunge. Um, that gave me a summer job and a, a after school job. Um, but I really was just thrown right into the mix of understanding the importance of a, a, a small local community and a hardware store's place within that and seeing how folks just, you know, sort of cherish the ability to go get a gallon of paint or, or you know, a pound of nails or whatever it might be from the hardware store um, and how easily that can be lost within a community. Um, but I also learned how to take things apart and put them back together. 
And, you know, so that hardware store experience really taught me a lot about community and a lot about using my hands. And um, as I, you know, I, eventually I went off to college and, and I went to school um, for a variety. I just changed my majors over and over and over. I really had no idea what I wanted to do, um, but I had this hobby of brewing beer and I was just completely in love with my hobby um, while living in Burlington, Vermont and, and, and really trying to struggle, struggling through sort of the process of figuring out what does life look like, you know, post-college and whatnot. And eventually I, I moved back to my hometown, jumped back in the ring with my dad at the hardware store as he was going through an expansion project. And I bought 10 acres of land in a little log cabin in the middle of Orange, Vermont. And I said, I can make a lot of beer here. And um, quickly realized I didn't have access to homebrew supplies in Orange, Vermont, started a homebrew store. And then, you know, that's where it really just starts to tumble. And um, you know, I, I built a small uh, a store called Local Potion, uh, a small home brewing supply shop. I was educating people on how to make beer at home. Um, that was supposed to migrate into commercial brewing. And uh, eventually I met a beekeeper named Todd Hardy. And um, rather than continuing on the beer path, I just fell in love with this idea of partnering with a farmer and really connecting, you know, a little closer to the agricultural side of, of where raw materials come from. And, um, and then, of course, learning the, the craft of distillation. I'm fascinated by people who work with honey for a number of different reasons. And I think chief among those reasons is the quasi evolutionary legacy that humans and bees share together. They were almost like the first domesticated animal in that they weren't really domesticated, but we, we, we were able to work with bees and harness the, the power of the sugar in their honey before we even domesticated animals as a species. And of course, meads sit right there, uh, contemporary with, or perhaps even predating ferments made from grains and grapes. So it's, you know, it's this tremendously old alcohol base, whether you're talking about a ferment or a distillate. And, and so in that respect, you know, I really, I'm I'm intrigued by people who work with bees because it's this continuation of this partnership that has evolved over millennia and millennia. And so that to me is inherently interesting and couple that with the fact that we are in a pollinator crisis right now uh, in terms of uh, not really understanding the effects that our chemicals have had on these bees and, and finally realizing that, man, we're in real trouble right now. So can, can you talk about that? partnership with the bees and with, of course, the people who, who, uh, who cultivate them and, and their hives and, and how that led into Caledonia spirits. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head with just the way that you entered the question, you know, it's, it's, um, the partnership with the bees has been, you know, carrying carried on for centuries and, um, it's never been as important as it is now because the bees are struggling, right. While, while humans are continuing to take over the entire planet. And, you know, for some reason we're, we're sort of straying from, from, you know, that, that mutual support, that symbiotic relationship that we've always had with bees. Um, you know, bees are really sort of, you know, the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, as, as, um, as, as we look at the health of, of the climate as an overall. Um, our connection with the bees is rooted from Todd Hardy, you know, our founder, um, you know, Todd is a beekeeper for, for, you know, his entire life long before we were distilling and, um, you know, he's just <clears throat> early on in Todd's career, he was communicating just the importance of keeping honey raw. You know, when you think about honey, you know, most of us think about like the the teddy bear at the grocery store. And it's this very like, you know, thin, fil filtered, you know, sort of um, absent of any real flavor or health benefits. And that's not really, it's kind of the honey nut Cheerios, you know, if you will. And that's not really how we think about honey. You know, we think of honey as this rich, you know, botanical laden, you know, beautiful sugar source that comes into the distillery poses all sorts of production challenges, you know, which, which keeps us, you know, the, the, the students, you know, in this distillery, which is all of us, you know, continue to, to have to try to work through challenges. Um, but we're not really going to know where those bees have been. Um, but we do know is that they're out there foraging. They're out there collecting, you know, pollen and nectar from all sorts of plants that, that circle, you know, this, this region where we live. And that is a challenge and an amazing opportunity when you bring it into the distillery. You know, we think of the beehive really as a tool and the bees as a partner that utilize that tool to extract that flavor that's around us and bring it into the spirits that we're producing. 
I will say that there is a bit of an analog here with a conversation that I had with a fellow Northeast spirits entrepreneur, uh, Effie Panagopoulos out of Boston, and uh, she makes mastica with the resin of the mastic tree. And one of the things that occurred to me as I was talking to her about that product is that it's almost like you're taking a flavoring agent that was distilled through a plant, right? The plant took up all these minerals and all the terroir, distilled it through the body of itself, and then put out this sap or resin that was harvested for you now to use in your spirit. Now, in the case of Bar Hill and the gins that you make using the honey, of course, we're not distilling through a plant. We're distilling through a little, a literal animal, another, uh, another organism that, uh, you know, flies around the world. And like you said, there's challenges in, uh, you know, you can't really put like a GPS tracker on every bee or a little electric fence, uh, that the bees will heed. The bees will go where they go. They will land on what flowers they land on. And it's, fascinating to me the complexity bound up in that because you get this raw product uh, we'll talk about the raw nature of honey as we go on here i'm sure and why the differences between that and and the teddy bear aforementioned but you know you're getting something that's been distilled through an organism and then deposited for you to use and uh the complexity there i think speaks quite a bit to the complexity of some of the spirits that we're going to be tasting later on uh, but I'd, I'd love to have you talk about those early days with Todd and perhaps how uh, Caledonia Spirits got off the ground initially, and then maybe we can um, jump into the tasting and talk about how you have uh, scaled and, and, and what makes your brand special. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, like I said, I mean, Todd was, was um, just, you know, he lives with the bees, you know, Todd is, is, you know, he refers to bees as the angels of agriculture, you know, and he, he really, I did not recognize the importance of bees until I spent time with Todd. Um, and he really made it very clear to me that, you know, whatever we're doing here, we're, we're going to add value to, um, you know, agriculture, specifically honey. I was very excited about grains. You know, I came into the distilling space, like, you know, yeah, Todd, let's work with honey. Let's also work with grains. Let's find local farmers. Let's let's get into the whiskey business. Um, and Todd's excited about that as well. But what we hadn't really recognized that was was that gin needed no apology attached to it. You know, you have a lot of craft distillers that that don't you know dive into gin because it goes to market quickly. And soon we start learning about you know the history of gin, you know, and the importance of agriculture and how these two things converge specifically in this very. Um, agricultural rich part of of the world you know we're in northern new england which is um you know it's just a beautiful place with small farms small houses everyone's sort of living in 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 this sort of harmonious way of of it's it's not a big agricultural field you know it's really a place where we can actually manage that farm responsibly and 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 strive to not pollute the river as we're growing the grain you know and and, and that's something that vermonters really align on so um, it just quickly became a really interesting opportunity to me. You know, it was a real challenge, even though I came in with sort of, you know, whiskey on the mind. Um, suddenly I started to, to really recognize the importance of that botanical influence of honey and the importance of bees within our food system. And it got really excited. Um, we all got really excited. But, you know, we, we had a 15 gallon direct fire still. You know, this thing was tiny. Uh, we'd run it once a week. And, you know, Todd had a 1997 Mercury Tracer station wagon. And, We'd load that thing up with gin and Todd would drive it to the farmer's market. And then eventually we're driving it to Boston and then eventually we're buying, driving it to New York. And it was like, no matter what, we would load that thing as full as we could possibly make it and, you know, pack every case of honey and every case of gin in, in the tracer. And um, it wasn't enough. So eventually we're running that same little 15 gallon still three times per day, every day. And, you know, we just could not produce enough gin. So we start scaling up, you know, we buy a 300 gallon still and, you know, try to recreate Bar Hill Gin in a 300 gallon still, which took us, you know, 18 months to, to, to actually get it right. Um, but once we finally recreated that, then we could make more gin and um, we start using trucks to make deliveries instead of the mercury tracer. And, um, you know, it's it just sort of, it's, it's just been tumbling ever since, you know, we continue to make, to make the same gin and strive to make the same high quality um, spirits partnering with the same incredible farmers. And um, the transition that we've seen is as we buy more honey, the farmers don't have to be marketers, right? Beekeepers can be beekeepers. And that's a really important piece of the puzzle. When beekeepers get to focus on the hive and the hive needs the help, you know, the distillers aren't particularly good at helping the bees. 
but what we can do is buy a lot of honey and pay a fair price for it. So gin becomes this vehicle, this, this agricultural opportunity for all of us where the, the, the beekeepers can stay with the bees, the distillers can stay in the distillery as long as we can get the bartenders um, you know, understanding where those materials are coming from. I really like the way that you communicated the ethos of farming in the Northeast, as opposed to perhaps the, you know, the larger tracts of middle America, where we have just thousands and thousands of square acres of wheat all at once or corn all at once. Uh, I come from not too far south of you in the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, kind of a similar situation the, the there's not a lot of farming, but where there is farming, uh, it tends to be fairly diverse within one particular piece of property. You know, there, there might be cows, there might be, you know, fields that get rotated uh, across uh, a number of different crops in any given year. And um, it really is a bit more of a what you might call closed system in that uh, it seems like when you're able to enter that system and really add value, the money really does have the opportunity to stay in that closed system. And, and I don't see that as a coincidence uh, in that you came up working in this you know, small town hardware store where, you know, you came in and you had to kind of revamp this and you saw the value of people coming in for that bucket of paint or for that, you know, for the nails that they needed, you know, those improved their, their home ecosystems or their business ecosystems. And then they, they came back and helped you out. So I, I really do think that in the story that you've told us so far, symbiosis seems to be a, a real kind of inflection point. And so I, I want to keep that the idea of the symbiosis in the air as we continue the rest of our conversation. But um, talk to me about the, the Bar Hill gin as a product. You mentioned that you had difficulty scaling it from the original direct fire skill still to the larger 300 gallon still. That's not a surprise to me. Botanical spirits are notoriously difficult to scale volumetrically. Tell me, tell me about the flavor profile that made this product popular. And uh, you can feel free to, uh, to guide me through the tasting at any point here, if you think it's useful to, uh, to actually get our, get our noses and, and palates on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and feel free to, to, to open up a bottle, you know, as they talk about it, you know, the, the um, Bar Hill gin is, is very much juniper forward, you know, and, and uh, we're striving for balance. Like I said, I'm a beer brewer, you know, by background. And so I think of, I think of gin as, as really sort of a, you know, kind of a pale ale opportunity, if you will, where you've got that resinous character of juniper, which, you know, is very similar to, to what you're working with, with, um, with profiles of hops. Um, but then similarly, honey provides this, this rich, creamy texture and a viscosity and a sweetness that is a really great balancing act for juniper. Um, but we start, you know, our distillation process is all about juniper. So we're using a tremendous amount of juniper in the vapor path. And we're really striving to, to extract that oil. And there's a couple specific ways that we, we do that within the vapor path that pull forward this sort of resinous, piney, very much Northeast um, kind of flavor. Um, until you add that honey, it's, it's obviously clearly out of balance, um, because we've, we've created such a dry product. Um, the honey comes in with this botanical influence and the mouthfeel, um, as well as sort of the, the aromatics that, that travel with that mouthfeel balances it out. So you get kind of a bigger, bolder expression, um, which I think holds up really well in cocktails also makes it so that you can really sip it on its own. There's enough to that gin to really, um, you know, enjoy it over ice or, or, or even meat. Um, but then ultimately what you get, you know, is that burst of botanicals and that's, that's the mystery, you know, that's, that's we're, we're, you know, we've been doing this for a decade and we're just now figuring out what questions to ask, um, you know, specifically around, you know, the region water supply to the, to the, to the bees. Um, you know, where are these bees actually collecting those floral components from, you know, I, I can't answer the question other than just looking at the map, right? We know where the apple orchard is. We know where the cherry orchard is. Um, but there's just a lot more mystery that lives within that. Mm. Can you clarify one thing for me? Yeah. So when you said when we add the honey, um, does that mean that this is a sweetened product or are you talking about the using the honey as the distillate base? The honey in the honey in our vodka is the distillate base. Right. Okay. So that, and that's part of the price point of Bar Hill vodka. It's fermented honey, 3000 pounds of raw honey per batch 
um, no grain, no potatoes. Um, with the gin, it's a GNS base, and then we're we're distilling GNS through the the botanical tray, and then we're sweetening with a little bit of raw honey. And part of the goal there is that there, there's much more um, honey character coming through in our gin products than there is in our vodka products, even though our vodka products are using, you know, literally thousands of pounds of honey. You know, just just it takes us about four pounds of raw honey just to make one jar of vodka. That that's uh yeah that's a lot that's a lot but it makes sense I mean that's how distillation works so okay so knowing that I have some gin related questions for you and these are not gotcha questions because gin is one of this gin gin is one of those categories where you know there's still a little bit of wiggle room in terms of defining something as new American style or a London dry style so so this is these are these are just sort of face value questions. Generally, when we talk about gin categories that are sweetened, nine times out of 10, you're going to see that called an old Tom gin because we have records of old Tom gin from back in the day that have been barrel aged, some that have not been barrel aged. So knowing that there is a little bit of sweetness added to this gin, how do you categorize Bar Hill when you have to just put one category on it? Is it a London dry style? Is it a new American style? How do you think of Bar Hill gin? It's hard, to be honest. We, we wrestle with this all the time. I mean, I, I guess if I had to pick one, I'd say we're going in the direction of Old Tom. But I find most of the Old Tom category to be slightly out of balance and therefore not really um, going to hold up as a one-to-one -one in a cocktail, right? So, so there's some, some challenges to sort of categorizing something that doesn't fit within the boundaries. Um, similarly, when we go down the path of new American, usually you're straying from juniper and we are leaning into juniper. You know, juniper is a huge part of our hill. It's crucial that, that we come out with that kind of big, bold, piney, resinous juniper character. Um, so there isn't really a category where bar hill fits right there. Um, which I'm fine with, you know, it might create some shelf set issues, you know, for the store, but I feel like those are, those are solvable problems as long as we like the flavor of the gin. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Uh, I mean, the juniper in Bar Hill is, is to be honest, one of my favorite parts. Uh, I, on my journey through gin from the very first time I tasted gin to now where I uh, commonly judge it for spirits competitions, I've had a, a number of different pivots and evolutions in my thinking about gin. And sometimes those pivots took me away from Juniper, depending on where we were in the culture of, or the, the zeitgeist of American gin drinking. Uh, you know, I was probably early to the new American style and was absolutely seduced by some of these more floral or herbaceous gins. And, and now I find myself returning to Juniper as sort of, uh, you know, an inflection point um, because that's really where gin came from. And if we just continue to stray so far from that juniper, I think we almost lose the essence of the category. So at, especially at this point in my thinking about gin, I love Bar Hill because the juniper is so, so splendid. Uh, I'll say it is, it is there, it is big, but it's not big in the same way that Tanqueray or Beefeater are big. It is big precisely in the way that you described, piney and resinous. And I don't know that those are going to be positive flavor words to everybody who comes across them on paper. Like piney and resinous, like, hmm, I don't know that I want to drink my martini and like get a big face full of pine. But what I say to those people is you really need to taste and nose some Bar Hill gin before you say that, because there's something, especially to me who grew up like you in a log cabin in the woods in the Northeast, like there is something uh, almost spine tingling about this. Uh, there's something energizing about it. And uh, that little hit of honey in there certainly doesn't, doesn't hurt that energy. Uh, so the Bar Hill gin, I, I agree with you, certainly defies to a certain extent the categorization. But um, I wonder if you might talk about how this product gained popularity and some of the use cases that really allowed it to spread across the country and across some of the best beverage programs in the nation. Yeah, happily. And, and thank you for those kind words. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, it, it certainly is, is a gin that we, we, we really enjoy drinking it and making it, you know, and, and for all those reasons, I mean, we're, we're all, many of our team, you know, we're born and raised in Vermont and, and, most of our team has moved to Vermont, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a group of people that really appreciate the place where we're doing this work. And, um, 
creating spirits that sort of take you to that place is an important part of, of what we do. Um, can I just elaborate a little bit on Juniper? There's something you, you hit the nail on the head in regards to, you know, there's so many gins out there that have so much going on, which is great. And, and as, a, as a consumer of gin, I really enjoy it. But one of the things that we realized um, in that original scaling up from 15 gallon still to 300 gallon still, it took us a long time to get that right. And eventually we realized there were some crucial things that we were doing within the distillation that had to be done exactly right. Now we operate three botanical extraction stills, um, you know, all three in the same space. We call it Gin Island. But, um, um, but you have to get that, it, it, you know, it's the juniper extraction curve. You know, there's some key sort of milestones that you have to achieve. And I can't really elaborate too, too further too much further on that, just just some, some some proprietary stuff. But my point here is this team has just completely geeked out about one botanical, which is juniper. And when we think about adding 18, 42 botanicals, whatever the recipe might be, how do you really know what's going on within all of those botanicals? Now that said, you know, we've we've really geeked out about juniper, but then suddenly honey is a complete mystery. Right. So we're 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 saying let's know what we can now and let's really understand that big bold resinous punch so that we can bring that that sort of natural mystery that honey delivers you know control what we can control with that process um taste smell color seasonality you know when, when the honey comes in the honey you know region it came from all of those things control what we can anything that doesn't fit the confines of gin we send it to the vodka program which naturally brings some character into vodka which is always a good thing um and then we take the most consistent honey that we can bring and the most floral honey that we can bring into the distillery and we put it into the gin program. That's really, really smart because, you know, I, I've been working on a project with someone who wants to use honey in it. And, you know, my first question is like, man, we can't control these bees. So, you know, it, it's, it's great in principle to say, yeah, let's use honey as a sweetener, honey, this, you know, rich, inherently beautiful sugar. But like, if you're going for any semblance of consistency, you know, inherently in distillation, you have, whether you're talking about a botanical spirit or a barrel age spirit or any sort of spirit where you have to source or grow anything, there's going to be differences from batch to batch. And although those differences can be interesting, especially if you decide that you want to play up those differences, um, at a certain point, people are going to want to walk up to your base expressions, especially and say, mm, okay, I know exactly what I'm getting out of this bottle. And that, of course, is particularly the case for bartenders. So I'm glad to hear that uh, you were able to, you know, kind of work that juniper extraction curve and implement some quality control measures on the distilling front in terms of what honey you use and what honey goes into the vodka. And so talk to me now about bartenders. You know, when, when did you start getting this Bar Hill gin into the hands of bartenders and, and what did they make that really allowed this spirit to sing and to uh, really seduce consumers who, um, you know, went from their bars to their liquor store to then pick up a bottle to use at home? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's been a slow build. I mean, you know, everything that we've done has started right here in the backyard, you know? So, I mean, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say we really built this brand at the farmer's market, you know, it was, it was those, those interactions, you know, folks, you know, chefs from Montreal would come to the Burlington farmer's market and be introduced to Bar Hill and then turn their bartender, you know, onto the product or, you know, there's sort of a, a handful of really organic, um, and natural just friendships that just were born over good gin. And, you know, I really, I think a lot of those early days meeting really interesting folks that appreciated our, our, our products largely here sort of on our turf you know here in vermont um, just sort of hub and spoke go out to market and started to build the brand um, i think the things that have really worked well for us is it's fairly simple right it's a simple recipe it's great raw materials and people are slowly starting to understand that we need these bees um, so all of that combines to it's not hard to work with Bar Hill, you know, a bee's knees cocktail, for example, you know, it's, it's a really simple cocktail. It's a great cocktail, gin, honey, lemon. Um, Bar Hill is, is a, is a great choice, you know, for the, for the gin, obviously, because of the honey aspect of it. And I think every cocktail menu in America needs to have a, a bee's knees on it. I don't see what, I mean, it, it's, it's, 
you know, there's a reason why it's called the bee's knees. It means the best. And um, it's just such a brilliant, you know, blend of, um, you know, just enough lemon acidity and, um, you know, a kick of gin and, um, and then honey as a balancing act. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. If you're like me, here are some things you might be like. You live in the mid-Atlantic. You enjoy meat. You highly prefer that your meat is local, sustainable, and comes from ethically raised animals. And you'd absolutely love for someone to deliver it to your door once a month. If this sounds like you, then you need Near Country Provisions in your life. Head over to nearcountry.com and check out their different, highly customizable meat delivery packages and also browse their growing seafood selection. As a thank you for being a Modern Bar Cart listener, you can get two free pounds of ground beef or bacon included in your first order after subscribing if you enter the code BARCART, all one word, at checkout. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, at checkout. Near Country Provisions is the real deal. And I can honestly say that I'd recommend them even if they weren't a sponsor. The meat and the local farmers they work with are just that good. Now, back to the show. And I think there's something about your product that actually trips a little internal trigger for any bartender who really gives a damn, which is if you're working with a product, the base spirit in particular, or that we'll call that the base of the cocktail, Um, if you're working with a cocktail base that is slightly sweetened, then what you as a bartender get to do that makes you feel like real, real good about yourself and how much, you know, is say, Hmm, I'm working with a slightly sweeter product. I'm going to step down or I'm going to really dial in instead of just following the one part, this two parts, this one part, this in the classic whiskey, sour or uh, sour cocktail format. You're like, Hmm, but wait, this is a little bit special. So I'm going to tweak my build accordingly. And bartenders love doing that. If I'm a bartender and I've got a standard old fashioned versus a sour cocktail where I've tweaked the build a little bit and somebody comes in and wants a recommendation, I'm going to inherently point them toward the one where I took that little extra step to make it a little bit more special. And not only does that improve the hospitality experience for the guest, it turns them on to the product that started all to begin with when they selected it for this cocktail in their program. So I think that's tremendously useful in terms of getting bartenders to be brand ambassadors for you in that they get immediately invested in your product. Is there anything else about the base bar hill gin expression that you want to talk about before we turn our attention to gin that has been in a barrel? I, I I love talking about barrel aged gin. Let's let's go there. Yeah, uh, I will say I've judged a number of barrel aged gins in the past, and as you alluded to earlier in our discussion with about Old Tom, it's a tough category. It's it tends not to be the sort of category where you get a distillery that puts a lot of focus on the barrel aging process. I can really only think of one other distillery on the East Coast that really spends a significant amount of time and energy on their barrel aged gins. And so I'm wondering how you thought about this product in relation to your base expression and how you went about crafting it because I had not to date tasted Tomcat before this, I had tasted the the Bar Hill base expression in a number of cocktails here at Beverage Programs in DC. But I'll tell you, man, like this is one of probably a half a dozen spirits that I've encountered over the past couple of years that as soon as I tasted it, kind of broke something in my brain and uh, and and some really interesting marrow leaked out of that break. So I'm hoping you can uh, you talk a little bit about how you developed the product. Yeah, for sure. Um, Tomcat was mostly an accident, to be to be honest. I'm, I'm going to be brutally honest here, but the, uh, you know, I, I had mentioned earlier we had a long process of going from the 15 gallon still to the 300 gallon still. You know, that gin, you know, we we got steps and steps and steps and just you know, we were so close, but we could still detect it blind and say that's not Bar Hill. We can't put it in a Bar Hill bottle. Um, but as you get toward the end of that very long journey you have some pretty good gin. And at the same time, I had mentioned to you that I really wanted to be making whiskey um, to the point where I had already ordered 
brand new American oak barrels. You know, I had a distillery full of brand new American oak that needed to get filled up or else it was going to shrivel up and leak and never really hold the seal. Um, we were broke. We had no money whatsoever. Every dollar was going into getting that gin still dialed in. Um, and I had a whiskey still that needed some attention. There was just work that had to be done there as well. So it was really a, sort of a bandwidth crisis moment where I shouldn't have bought those barrels. And that gin tasted so great. It was really means of procrastination saying, I can't put another batch of gin down the drain. So I put it in the barrel and I put it in, you know, brand new American oak barrel. I filled them up and I threw them up in the loft of the Hardwick distillery. And, um, Within just a few weeks, you know, I, I opened up a barrel and I said, oh, my gosh, this is like um, you, you'd mentioned sort of the, the, you know, the woodsy terrain of the Northeast. And it was like everything piney and resinous, you know, of, of, of that you get with Bar Hill. Um, but it had this like um, oak meets pine sort of like coniferous blend between the two. And it just took me back to my childhood of like building forts in the woods with my friends. And, and it was like it just smelled like exactly what I wanted to taste. And um, so we left it in the barrel a little bit longer. And, um, you know, we really found over the period of time, you know, we were questioning whether the juniper character would hold up in the barrel, you know, should gin be a long-term aged product. And we finally came to this, this range of, of six months, six to eight months is really kind of that sweet spot of, you know, botanical essence is still really strong and pronounced, you know, wood character is, is, is really starting to contribute. Uh, the brand new American oak barrel takes that gin, but gives it this sort of um, uh, like boldness, bourbon sort of esque boldness that I think is really crucial to to how folks are using it in cocktail programs. Um, but it's it's really a spirit that um, um, my partner Sarah, um, she was actually pregnant at the time, and I'd bring home samples of Tomcat, and I'd say, "What do you think of this?" And she wouldn't drink it because she was pregnant, but she'd smell it, and she would not stop smelling it. And it was sort of this. Our family was just really in love with the spirit, and we said, "Man, this this is this is something we got to take to market." Yeah, I I will echo your sentiment about the the continuation of that woodsy vibe. To me, I love when I encounter, especially in an aged spirit, any sort of cedar notes. And to me, the the warmth and the woodiness really brings it in that direction of something cedary and and uh, you know, like a almost like a cedar chest to me. And and I, I love that it's um it's a very dark product for a barrel aged gin. Not not unusually so, but it is a dark gin. I many, many barrel aged gins, uh, you will see distillers and rightly so, become concerned that they're going to just blow the gin character out of their gin with the barrel. And so you tend to see more lightly colored barrel-aged gins. And in addition to that, if you think about a barrel-aged gin program, this is going back to the point that I made earlier about, you know, like the fact that not too many gin distilleries are actually focusing or putting any significant focus on their barrel aging program. Usually a barrel-aged gin comes out of a serendipitous interaction with another distiller in the area saying like, Hey, I've got a couple of these barrels. Do you, you know, do you want them? And then, Oh, oh yeah, I guess we'll stick some gin in those and do a special barrel aged gin release. It is a special release, but because it's a special release, you don't get to spend that time kind of tweaking those little, uh, little volume levers to get it just to where you want it to be. So when I see the Tomcat and I see this really nice, almost bourbony color to it, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it really makes me stand up and pay attention in relation to other barrel aged gins out there. And so I guess my sort of specific follow up would be, are you using like a hundred percent new American oak barrels for this gin across the board? Yeah, 100% new American oak. Um, we're working with three different coopers. You know, there is a specific blend. You mentioned cedar, you know, that kind of cedar quality comes from one specific Cooper and we have to manage that, you know, there's, there's a couple of specific notes. I mean, you know, Cooper's, you know, they'll give you the specs, you know, number three, you know, medium toast, number three char. And, and, you know, that from one Cooper is not the same as that from another Cooper. It's, 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 it's a way to calibrate our minds, but the reality is you've got to taste what's in that barrel to know what, what, you know, what that Cooper has done with that barrel and how your spirit's going to, you know, work as a solvent to extract, you know, what remains in the wood. And so that's, you know, blending is, 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 is a requirement in the gin space. And in my opinion, um, 
we do some work with single barrel, um, but really not a lot. You know, you really have to manage that closely, you know, because ultimately we're, we're striving for, like you said, there's a big, bold American oak flavor there that can't lean in any one direction too heavily. And um, similarly, the way that we get to you know, get away with that and celebrate that is that back to that big, bold, resinous juniper, right? It, it's always a balancing act, you know? So there's there's a lot of, of um, juniper character that's gonna sort of, you know, drive this flavor. And then honey is a balancing act. And then we're just, you know, sort of trying to sprinkle in that wood character and, and not take it any one direction too far, you know, keep that balance as we build that uh, flavor profile. So to anyone out there who has thought about perhaps sipping a gin and become sort of repulsed at the idea of just taking a sip of especially uniced or undiluted and unchilled gin, uh, I would say that uh, if you are interested in correcting that notion, I would begin with a pour of the Tomcat because it's eminently sippable. Um, you know, I, I really do appreciate the mixability of both these spirits. And as we mentioned, I'm sure, you know, bartenders across the country uh, also appreciate that. But there's something just so satisfying about sipping, especially the Tomcat, just neat or on the rocks. Uh, it is it's a remarkable spirit for its uniqueness and also its balance. So, I mean, you know, that's that's why I was so excited to talk to you about these two spirits today, because I think that they're they're unique victories and balance in, in different ways. And it, it's been really interesting to hear you talk about the different ways that you went about achieving that. And especially knowing some of those, you know, financial constraints and equipment constraints that, uh, that led to some of these discoveries. So, uh, such as life being uh, an entrepreneur, a small business person. Uh, but I guess the last question I had about these gins, particularly right here in the glasses in front of me is, do you ever encounter uh, issues using these gins in a situation where that honey is going to cloud the drink? Um, does that does that mean that they lend themselves more to a shaken sour format as opposed to perhaps a, a martini format where people might look at that haze from the honey and be like, eh? Like ever, you ever encounter that sort of thing? Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, we, we sit right on the edge of louching, you know, that's an intentional effort. You know, we, we push, you know, our, our distillation, we, we want that flavor and we, we strive to, you know, take it right to the very edge. So of course, you know, when it lands in a cocktail, you know, depending on, on, you know, how that cocktail was made, you know, you, you can get some, some, uh, some clouding in the glass. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not I'm not an experienced bartender. You know, I'm a fan of bartenders. You know, I, I, I'm a fan of farmers. I, I really live in my seat as a, as a distiller and appreciate, you know, the other both sides of that. Um, so, I, you know, when I when I look in at, at, at the bartending community, you know, I think there's some interesting challenges and some brilliant creativity there. But, you know, when I talk with Sam Nellis, you know, our, our beverage director, you know, he leans into that. He says, celebrate that flavor, celebrate that reality. And um you know, we're also sitting here in sort of like the home of the, the cloudy IPA craze, you know, it was sort of, you know, the, 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 the New England IPA, if you will. So, you know, we're not afraid of cloudy drinks, but, um, you know, I think it's it, every martini drinker, you know, carries their own specific desires and, and some folks celebrate that. And I think, you know, sort of these contemporary new American gin styles are continuing to change the martini and and i think i think many of us are going to say hey let's embrace this i think many of us are going to say hey let's keep it traditional and, and and keep my martini looking the way it's looked for for 50 years and um, e each to their own but um there's plenty of cocktails undoubtedly when you get into you know shaken citrus cocktails bar hill's going to do really well um you know spirit forward you know sort of um whiskey cocktails with a tomcat substitute you know that does incredibly well for us and and um you know, in, in Bar Hill, you know, I, I always lean in with the bees knees. Yeah, for sure. And and specifically with the louching or the louching or however folks choose to pronounce that, uh, it made me think of a Corpse Survivor number two because of the uh, inclusion of absinthe in that drink. Another one of those uh, botanical spirits where where the louching occurs when you when you dilute it. So uh, if you're going for that, I, I'd say, you know, give give this bar hill base expression uh, a shot in a corpse survivor number two and see how that juniper plays against the lemon juice and the curacao 
And I think that you'll be remarkably surprised about how refreshing that is because in that drink, oftentimes the juniper gets a little bit drowned out by some of those other ingredients. But I think with the Bar Hill Gin, and I haven't done this yet, I think the Corpse Survivor number two, especially during this last push, I don't know how, I don't know how hot it is up in Vermont, but here in DC, it is freaking miserable right now. So I think that, that if anyone hears this podcast and is looking for a little reprieves from some of this summer mugginess, uh, try that Corpse Survivor number two and uh, let us know what you think of it. Tag us at Modern Bar Cart on Instagram and uh, give us some tasting notes. So now that we've done the tasting, now that we understand the backbone and the ethos of Bar Hill, I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about gin in general with me. Gin's a category that I love, and obviously we've been going through a type of gin explosion here in the U.S. I've heard that it sort of pales to the gin revival that is occurring in Europe right now with all the tremendous gin expressions that are coming out of that continent. Uh, so I wonder if you might give us your thoughts on the kind of excitement around gin that's occurred over the past five years or so, and maybe some of the good things about that and some of the perhaps unintended consequences that you've seen as a distiller. Yeah, happily. You know, I, I think it's about time. You know, I, I think, you know, gin, historically, I mean, gin, you know, gin is at the core of the cocktail menu. You know, if you look, you know, before Prohibition, during Prohibition, after Prohibition, you know, it was great marketing that convinced, you know, particularly Americans that vodka made sense. But the reality is that flavorless, odorless, neutral is not something that we crave when looking for, you know, a dining experience. And so for some reason, it's give me the flavorful plate of food and the bland drink, you know, and that, that doesn't really make any sense to me. The reality is that gin is that flavor. Um, and, you know, I think, I think there's particularly with, with all the work, the craft distilling is sort of leading, you know, there's, there's all sorts of opportunity to extract really interesting flavors. Um, you know, I, I look at the gin market, Americans still drink, even today with this sort of gin renaissance that we're seeing, Americans still drink eight times more vodka than gin. And, I, I can't come to terms with that. You know, that, that it, it doesn't quite add up to me. Um, but so it goes. Um, the, and even with our vodka program, we strive to bring a little bit of character. We, we, we you know, it's, it's flavorless, odorless, neutral compared to any other uh, spirits category. Um, but on the nose, I'm hoping that you'll know when you drink our vodka that this came from Ron. And, and that's, that's pushing the edge of that boundary. But I think that's fair game to do so. Some of the unintended consequences, you know, I, I think back to what I said earlier about, you know, sort of the gin with an apology, you know, it's, it's, um, I think if, if craft distillers are choosing to make a gin, you know, make it a great gin and, and, and sell it with, with confidence that you've made a great gin, you know, it's, it's, um, I just think there's so many conversations I've listened into them, you know, where it's, I'll, I'll have whiskey someday for you, but in the meantime, can you buy my gin? Cause it helps me make payroll or, you know, you hear those conversations in the craft space and it, it, craft is really an opportunity to make better quality products. And, you know, same thing with the barrel aged gin, you know, there's, there's so, so often you get a free barrel. So you fill it with gin. You know, I, I think distillers should really be striving to find the perfect barrel to put their gin in and and then celebrate it when it comes out and i think i think we're seeing more and more of that but in the early days of this gin renaissance there was a lot of just stuff thrown at the market to see what people wanted without really understanding what the gin drinker was looking for and you know we, we caught on to that early on when we said we've made great gin this gin is working really well in these cocktails let's stop talking about whiskey program I mean, we make whiskey we just put it in the barrel we haven't taken it out yet and we don't really talk about it in the market very often if somebody comes here to gin lane to the distillery you know, happily, we're going to show you everything that we're doing here. Um, but when we're out in market, we, we want to talk about what we're actually putting in a bottle. And and um, and because we want to see the craft that's happening at the bar. You know, that's the real excitement for me is to, you know, get into the city and see what people are doing with the products we're making here. Yeah. Yeah. Gin as an apology, man. It's it's tough. It's tough. I mean, you're, that's never going to go away. I, I know. I, I hope you're, I hope you're aware of that. You know, it's just one of those economic imperatives for anybody who's trying to start a small operation. But I figure instead of criticizing that, I might just shout out a few people here in the mid Atlantic who are doing a really nice job. Um, there's McClintock distilling out of Frederick, Maryland who have launched uh, three or four beautiful gin expressions before they even put any of their whiskey to market. And they really, you know, 
some of the best batch one gin I've ever tasted. And uh, also uh, Melissa down at Durham Distilling with Conniption Gin, just doing some some really wonderful stuff as well and really celebrating it as a product. And, you know, I, I, I forget who I was talking to, but recently I was speaking to someone uh, who mentioned that in those old bar books, you know, the, the Jerry Thomas and the, um, uh, what was the, um, the, the Savoy cocktail book, Harry Craddock, like there's some inordinate proportion of those cocktails that were made with gin to your earlier point. And so, you know, the, it, it sort of begs the question of like, well, those cocktails aren't gone. Those cocktails are still viable formats. And yet like we have somehow through some sort of marketing, uh, beyond our understanding have come to a place where despite the fact that we have all these beautiful gin applications, we are somehow operating at a dearth of actual high quality gin and a, a dearth of respect for that product. So uh, I do appreciate as somebody who dearly, dearly loves gin as a category, the, the work that you are doing at Bar Hill to uh, really make this category something truly special. Uh, I really do hope that uh, maybe you'll take the opportunity to make the hazy martini a thing since we're still at peak hazy IPA right now. Like I feel like I feel like this is a really prime opportunity to bring that marketing campaign out to all your bar programs in Boston and all those places and uh, maybe maybe make the hazy martini a thing. We will totally here at Modern Bar Cart just blast that out. The hazy martini uh, is something that I am so ready to get on board with. But I guess the last thing I'll ask in the main portion of this interview is what's next for Bar Hill in general and, and Ryan Christensen in particular? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, uh, we, we are students, right? All of us are students, you know, we, we, um, we, 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 this whole journey, you know, has just been a 15 gallon still leads to a 300 gallon still it leads to a 27,000 square foot production facility in Montpelier. And, you know, now we sit you know, um, in this 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 new distillery, which we're finally getting really truly dialed in. You know, with the, the street sign is Gin Lane, and you know, it sort of feels like we're ready to to, to operate here. And um, and folks are coming in. And Eric, if you ever can get up to Vermont, I'd love to show you the space. But everything here on Gin Lane takes you all the way from the agricultural side. So you know, the grain silo, drums of honey, to the distillery, to a world class cocktail bar. And, and we're really trying to make sure that folks come in here and you know, understand sort of the agricultural side of the business and understand how you celebrate it, how you take it home, how you make cocktails at home. Um, and then how, to, how, to, you know, how does rye grain become whiskey? You know, how does honey become gin? How does you know, all of these things, you know, that's the distiller's role. Um, so I think what's next is, is understanding the work that we do here even further. You know, like I said earlier, we're just learning how to ask the right questions to really understand the flight of the bee and and how that makes its way in so we've we've invested a lot recently in our laboratory space um you know josh who heads up our lab is is really geeking out about sort of the sensory aspect of honey you know the the, the geographical aspect of of honey and then also the microscopic level you know can we actually detect specifically what pollens these these bees you know are bringing back to the hive because that's ultimately going to make the gin taste better you know if we can really understand that understanding that we won't know it all. Like I said, I, I don't actually think we will know it. I think we're just slowly going to, you know, I think it's decades of work ahead for us to really kind of um, resolve any of the mysteries that live here. So anyway, just being students, that's what keeps us here. That's what keeps us excited. Um, the work is still incredibly enjoyable for the whole team. And uh, we just want to keep making great gin. Well, it seems like you guys are rolling in a pretty impressive way. I look forward to the possibility that in the future, maybe we can have some sort of Tales of the Cocktail seminar where you kind of break down some of these differences in different types of honey and and share with bartenders and distillers from all over the world how you've been able to you know, really ask these deep questions to an organism that can only answer you with the product that it creates by distilling agricultural products through its body. So I think that that's a, it's a really deep question. And uh, I think that it, it makes sense that you and your team taking that, that student mentality uh, are the ones who are really pushing the boundaries of that quest for further and deeper understanding. So is there anything else uh, that you want to share with us about uh, Bar Hill or your facility or your products before we jump into the lightning rounds? 
No, just just come visit us, Gin Lane, Montpelier, Vermont. It's uh, it's, it's a great spot to be. So come sit on the river and uh, have a cocktail with us. Amazing. All right, on to the lightning round. First question: What's your favorite cocktail? And maybe let's say, what's your favorite cocktail besides a bee's knees? We'll go with that. Yeah, I guess I'll give you two if I can. You know, the the cocktail I'm most apt to make at home is probably a martinez. And, you know, and, and that's, that's, you know, classic cocktail, uh, the precursor to the martini, um, it's a gin cocktail. So I've had a lot of fun. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm a total novice bartender and, and proud to be, you know, learning from the team of bartenders that work here. But the, um, I love to just, just perfect my Martinez and switch from Bar Hill gin to Tomcat gin. And, and, you know, sometimes I play with the ratios, but generally just kind of stay the course and, um, enjoy. Um, the other one I, I want to mention, mostly because I miss going out to market. I haven't been traveling as much as I used to, but um, anytime I was in market, I used to always it sort of became a bit of a tradition. But I'd end my market visit, I'd you know by myself go to a cocktail bar, meet a stranger, you know bartender, and and order a last word with Bar Hill. And sometimes I didn't even introduce myself, just just enjoy the the last word before I you know caught the early flight in the morning. And it really became sort of this this uh, closure of a of a trip to market, and uh, it's not a cocktail I make very often at home, but uh, it's it's a really great cocktail. Mm. Two cocktails both have maraschino, so we think we learned a little bit about uh, about your your palate affinities right there, and certainly I think some of the uh, some of the texture of the maraschino liqueur and what it lends to a cocktail um, plays in the same space as what honey does as well. So I think that, that that's a that's great. The last word is also my favorite cocktail. So nice. What's your seemingly small or idiosyncratic occurrence that always makes your day? Mine is sword day. So my wife and I will often walk our dog to the dog park and uh, there's a basketball court between here and there. And there's a, there's an older uh, Chinese couple who is out there every morning at like 7 a.m. And they're doing uh, different Tai Chi regimens with uh, a boom box. And sometimes they'll just be using their hands. Sometimes they'll have uh, actual fans out as they do these forms. And sometimes I get to see two septuagenarians or octogenarians on a basketball court with awesome swords and whenever it's sword day i'm like you know what something bad might happen later but for now it's sword day and this is awesome so that's my little idiosyncratic occurrence what's something that always makes your day man um how do i contend with sword day that, that's a good one <laughs> um the, the uh well, I'll, I'll give you just generally, you know, we're we're uh, like like any you know young entrepreneurial business, we're growing and always growing, and the team gets bigger. I think the thing that really makes my day, and and I have a couple examples, you know, I could share, but the um, the responsibilities grow as the company grows, and people take ownership, and that's what's really worked for us so well is that you know, Scott, our lead distiller, I mean, he can run six stills at once. He can juggle. It's, 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 it's amazing. But, you know, the other day I walked in the distillery and he's just polishing Phyllis, our column still. And it was just sort of, I could tell he just knew that Phyllis needed a bath bath. And I didn't have to say, Hey, can somebody wash the still? Or, you know, I didn't have to wash the still. I just walk in and it was, it wasn't like a task. It was like, it's Friday and I'm just going to polish the still. And you sort of drive home that night thinking, I think we've got it. We've got the formula. You know, we've got people that want to make sure the equipment is running in tip top shape without being told to do so. They do it because it feels good. You know, you've worked a hard week with Phyllis and you got to make sure that Phyllis goes into the weekend as well. Yeah, I love that. That's that's such a such a gratifying thing as somebody who did so much work on the front end, building building the brand and and building the products to to just have that go a little bit on autopilot to actually see that flywheel turn on its own a little bit is uh, certainly gratifying. So that's a wonderful wonderful answer. If you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us a picture. I think it, I mean it's a it's a big world, but I, I think I'm going to stick with the entrepreneurial theme here. Um, there's somebody that I, I've I've always just really looked at and said, how did he do that? And and that's um, Yvonne Schwinnard in Patagonia, and how that company has grown. It's a huge company. It's insanely huge. And to look at the size of that company, 
but how they have prioritized sort of their environmental activation and never lost sight. Quite frankly, they built a bigger microphone and said more meaningful words into the microphone as the company has grown. And it's so not the way business is done generally that I just want to like peel the layers back there. And, and I would just love to just kick back with Yvonne and, and say, tell us some more stories, you know, just because I, I just can't imagine, you know, the, the boardroom, so to speak, you know, at Patagonia when Yvonne says, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. And um, so anyway, um, I'm not even sure if he drinks, um, but let's assume for this conversation that he does. But I think I think I would I would probably bring him. Uh, we make a spirit um, from the root of the burdock plant. It's uh, burdock is this, this um, grows in the Northeast. It's everywhere. It gets in your dog's fur. It's kind of these, these little ping pong shaped. It's actually the, the, it's, uh, it's the inspiration for the invention of Velcro. That's how sticky the stuff is. Um, but we, we harvest with, with a local farm, the, the burdock, we, we pull up the roots and then we make a product we call gobo, which is um, Japanese for burdock, but it's a spirit made from the roots of the burdock. And it's almost like a, like a tequila esque flavor, you know, it's got this incredible earthy, oily, big viscosity sort of um, really interesting character. Um, but I'd love to pour some of that for him. So it's not a cocktail, you know. We could we could come up with a cocktail, but I, I think I'd like to just drink some gobo with Yvonne Chouinard. Yeah, certainly, certainly resonates with uh, you know burdock is is in the same conversation as other bitter ingredients like gentian, which is, you know, you know, the, the alpine sort of, you know, or subalpine regions where these things are harvested, you know, just kind of, you, you could, you imagine yourself wearing a Patagonia jacket or something like that. And, uh, yeah, that, that's a really intriguing spirit. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that at some point I can make it up and, and grab some of that. Is that something that's generally a smaller release that you keep in market in Vermont? Yeah, we just sell it direct consumer here at the distillery um we, we might eventually you know think more about you know putting it into distribution but um we work really hard to stay focused and it's hard to stay focused you know that, that's that's kind of like a you know step one stay focused you know that, that's that's an important piece of our work so we we do a lot of this work in you know sort of the 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 other things the things that really kind of um you know, just, just get us thinking outside the box. We keep those confined to the lab space, which keeps the batch size pretty small. Um, you know, we, we need to say, make sure that we can still buy the honey that we've committed to the, you know, we can't go spend it all on burdock. <laughs> yeah. Don't spend all your honey money on burdock kids. If there's one thing you learned from this episode, it had better be that. <laughs> um, Business advice. Uh, so the last thing here, do you have any unusual or controversial beliefs in the spirits or cocktail world? Um, yeah, probably, you know, I, I, I guess, I mean, the big one for me is that I, I, I feel like the distilled spirits industry has had sort of a pass on sustainability. Like I, I know we all talk about it, but as an industry, like, you know, we, we, as an example of this, you know, we just started, a project to study our own greenhouse gas emissions and you know why isn't that a requirement why why wouldn't we want we want to have any proof gallons per day we produce but we should know how much did we pollute the earth to do that or better yet you know how much can we offset that so we don't pollute, pollute the earth in doing that but the first part of doing that is measuring it and understanding it and you know we've been doing this for a decade and we just started measuring this We've, we've done all sorts of things to improve it. You know, don't get me wrong. We've, we've invested heavily in, in our own sustainability efforts, but if you can't quantify it, you know, how do you really know it's working? And, you know, I, I just look at the industry and, you know, there's all sorts of gray zone when you study greenhouse gas emissions, you know, you don't have to include the packaging of your product if you don't want to. And I'm thinking, well, isn't that one of the biggest polluters of the whole industry? You know, so it doesn't seem like that should be optional. Um, but I'm just interested in, in, in the whole industry sort of adopting a standard, you know, so that we can all then play by those rules and measure up against those rules. But as long as there's no standard for all of us, how do you even know who's on the scoreboard and who's doing the right thing and who's doing the wrong thing? Uh, yet another excellent question uh in a whole lineup of excellent questions that uh that you have on your plate to answer here. So Ryan, I think that. This has been a really fun conversation for me on a number of levels. One, of course, I get to learn the story of, of your excellent products. And two, I so appreciate that 
beginner's mindset and the student mentality that you bring to this, even after a decade of having been in business, I think that that sort of mindset to me makes you even more of a leader than otherwise you would be if you were, you know, out there communicating yourself as a thought leader in something else, right? I think having that, that beginner's mindset and the student mentality are really important to continuing to advance the industry. Um, so in that respect, I thank you not only for your awesome products, but for the awesome work that you're doing up there in Vermont. Hopefully next time I do find myself up in the Northeast, I can take a quick trek out, a little day trip up to uh, Gin Lane and visit you all. Uh, but can you just wrap us up here by telling our listeners the best way to get in touch with you and Bar Hill Gin in the digital space and uh, the best way to get your products, especially if there is a place where they can go to purchase a bottle online and have it shipped to their door? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody can go to barhill.com, www.barhill.com. Um, we do have a store finder, and that also will help you figure out where you are and, you know, best you know, best way to access Bar Hill, um, be it uh, be it shipped directly or or nearby store. Um, you can also find us on Instagram um, at Bar Hill Gin on Instagram. Um, we're on Facebook and all the other social medias as well. And then personally, I'm on Instagram as Distill underscore Vermont. Fair warning: there's there's a sprinkling of you know my dogs Pinto and Merle, my kids, and you know the whole it's 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 the distiller dad thing. So you get a little bit of distilling, a little bit of family, and a little bit of. Uh, you know, kayaking on Lake Willoughby or whatever it might be, but uh, Vermont life, as we say. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, Ryan, I hope that you can make a go of that hazy martini thing. And uh, thanks so much for being a guest here on the Modern Bar Cart podcast. Eric, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode is made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, gin making and apiological insights courtesy of Bar Hill Gin master distiller Ryan Christensen, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.